Good evening and welcome to our talk on gas, LNG and the energy crisis. This is uh, one of a series of talks we've arranged in the last couple of years around the topic of e the energy transition and humanity's response to climate change, a subject that goes to the very heart of our long-term welfare. I'm delighted to introduce Gavin Law as our speaker this evening. Gavin is head of Wood Mackenzie's gas and power practice. He's spent the last 30 years working in this field and is one of the world's leading experts in LNG. He has a doctorate in petroleum geochemistry, um, but despite this, he's assured me that he is be staying away from the technical side of the industry <laughs> and instead is going to set the scene uh, for those of us who are not experts, giving us an insight into the workings of the European gas market and the changes through which it's going. He, he is delighted to take any questions you have at the end of his talk. In the autumn, when we were planning this talk, uh, the press was full of stories about energy rationing in Europe and the hardship being caused by freezing homes. Since then, record winter temperatures from Bilbao to Belgrade have not only allowed beach volleyball to be played on New Year's Eve, but also helped gas prices fall and storage facilities to be filled, and the focus of the press instead to move on to the early release in Spain of a book entitled En la Sombra. If we're to believe the level of coverage in the press, it appears that the energy crisis is over and we will survive the winter and perhaps our talk is a little late. But at McEnroe and Wood, we believe that this is too simplistic and too short-term a view to take. Our clients come to us with long-term horizons and they come knowing that we share them. And I'm confident that Gavin will help us understand whether or not the energy crisis is over and how we should think about its long-term impact. Kevin, over to you. Um, the European energy crisis that we're experiencing now affects everyone. Whether you're in Japan, Pakistan or the UK, the impact of the crisis is being felt in the near term through higher utility bills, fuel shortfalls, inflation and higher rates of interest. In addition, the crisis implications for the energy transition, near term with, with companies switching to use coal rather than gas, and longer term with more rapid shift away from fossil fuels. So before we consider the crisis, we've got, we need to look at how the gas market works. Gas is not like oil. It's very different physical characteristics. It comes in different forms, its cost structures are different, its trade is different, and its price formation is different. So it's really important that we understand what we see happening in the, in the market is related to the fact that this isn't just a, a commodity like oil. So what we're going to do in the first half of this presentation is talk about the fundamentals of pipeline gas and LNG. So let's go back to basics. What is natural gas and LNG? Natural gas is primarily methane, um, so one single carbon atom and, and four hydrogen atoms. Apart from methane, natural gas may contain other things, ethane, propane, butane, so higher homologues, and then inerts like CO2, uh, hydrogen sulfide and nitrogen. And methane, methane is odourless, despite the fact that when you smell gas in your house, it smells. That's because they add something to it, uh, a mercaptan. Um, and will, flu will, will rise in air, so it will disperse if accidentally released. So if you get gas released, <coughs> it, will, it, will, um, it will disperse. LNG, and this is not to be confused with LPG, which is literally petroleum gas, which is just principally propane and butane. LNG is effectively liquefied natural gas. It's cooled to minus 160 odd degrees uh, with methane the predominant component. It's essentially pipeline gas taken off the pipeline or from, supplied from a field and liquefied. It's at atmospheric pressure. So that's quite often people uh, assume that these ships that they see are under pressure, they're not. They're at atmospheric pressure. The, 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 the gas is now in a liquid form. 
and its volume is about one six hundredth of its volume as a gas. So when you're thinking about energy density, which is quite an important part of fuels, LNG, you need to liquefy gas to get that energy density to be able to put it in a ship and transport it um, economically. So there are two main pathways for the commercialization of natural gas. The one that most people are familiar with is you produce it in an upstream field. It could be onshore, it could be offshore. You then compress it to put it in a pipeline. You transport it along the pipeline and you maybe compress it along the way. Then you get to the market that you're going to sell it in. You decompress it at a receiving station and then you supply it to the market. And that might be a power generation. It might be a reticulated gas network for, for commercial or domestic use. The second route is through LNG. So you liquefy it, so you cool it down. And we'll talk a little bit about that process. Then you stick it in a ship, you transport it, you, you, at the other end, wherever the market is, you regasify it, you heat it back up again, and you put it into the market, usually relatively close to where it's received. So generally in power, uh, in power generation, but also in domestic gas. And if you look at the economics of LNG versus pipelines, you can see that pipelines are more economical over shorter distances. And then as the distance increases from supply to market, then LNG becomes the favored uh, uh, um, monetization option. So whether it's an offshore pipeline or an onshore pipeline has a bit of effect. But essentially, it's, the, it's those upfront costs of liquefaction that make it the, the LNG, even if you're thinking only a few hundred kilometers, you still have to liquefy it. And it's that upfront cost that means that red line starts at a very high level. So that's why if you have the choice, you stick it in a pipeline because it's a lot easier. But if your markets are very distant, then you've got no choice. You can't build pipelines that are three or 4,000 kilometers long. You can, but the, the economics are much better to do it as LNG. Unless you're in a sort of land situation like Russia, or you know, the Ukraine, etc., Western Europe, where you've got no choice. You're talking, you can't put it in a ship, so you've got no choice but to put it in a pipeline. But apart from cost, there are other factors to consider when deciding between LNG and pipelines. So I've got my gas resource. Obviously, the distance to market's important. If, if it's a long way, it's LNG. If it's a short distance, then pipelines make the most sense. Then there's the volume of gas. There's a critical mass element associated with LNG. In order to justify those significant costs, you need to have a certain volume of gas discovered. So if you've got a very small discovery, it's probably not going to be LNG. Whereas with pipelines, you, you don't have to have any size, specific size. It just has to be commercially viable. Now, the longer your pipeline, the more gas you probably need. But essentially, you can see very small discoveries in the North Sea being connected by pipeline with, at, at, at commercial rates. Project cost. The, the, the LNG is expensive, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Some crazy amounts of money spent within the LNG space. Whereas in the pipeline business, it varies, and it really varies on distance. And, and, and diameter of pipeline, et cetera. But distance is the primary driver. So if you've got long distance, you can have high cost. If short distance, it'll be, it'll be lower. Diversity of markets. With LNG, you can go anywhere. You don't, you're not tied to an endpoint as you are with a pipeline. That's the problem we've got with Russia. That pipeline flows one way and that's, that's the only choice you've got. So as a supplier, that gas can only go to one place. Now as a buyer, that gives you some security unless they decide to do what Russia's done and cut you off. But with LNG, somebody says, I actually don't want your LNG anymore, you just take it somewhere else. Land accessibility. Um, with LNG, you just need a relatively small amount of land, whereas with pipelines, you need to access that full pipeline route. Now, if that's 
onshore, that may be getting rights of way across thousands of kilometres, which can be very costly. If it's offshore, it tends to be cheaper. But certainly land accessibility is, is, is relatively important. But it clearly, what is fundamental is that in order to have LNG, you have to have a substantial maritime component in the transport. Now, I'm just going to a slight aside here. You'll hear a lot of talk about unconventional gas, shale gas, tight gas, various forms. This gas is no different from conventional gas that you would get in the North Sea. It's just the way it's extracted. It, it's more complex in terms of its extraction process. It involves drilling wells then and producing gas from very low permeability and per low porosity rocks. So it, it, the rocks that we used to drill through and go, yeah, that's of no interest, are now of interest. Because by putting down, uh, by drilling wells into them, particularly horizontal wells, and then fracturing them and keeping those fractures open, we can now produce gas. And they've been doing it for uh, 20, 30 years in the US. It just became really economic to do it about 10 years ago. When, when people had the experience to do it. But as you'll see from the chart, the fact is the USA dominates the, the unconventional space. And that's not just because that's where they did it first. It's because fundamentally the basins in the US are better suited for unconventional development. So we've heard lots of talk about people saying, yeah, we can do it in Lancashire, you know, the basins are much smaller, access to land is much more difficult. The prospect of unconventional gas production in the UK is, is minimal. The other thing just to add is there's a thing called coal seam gas, which is also what considered unconventional. So in Australia, we've seen a lot of coal seam gas being developed or coal bed methane, and that's basically taking gas out of, out of coal seams. So the LNG value chain comprises five stages, and here's a schematic diagram. You go from upstream, which everybody's familiar with, platforms offshore or onshore. Then you go to the, you bring the gas to the liquefaction facility. That liquefaction facility is just essentially a big freezer. It reduces the, the, the temperature of the gas through multiple phases till the point that it liquefies all again under essentially relatively low pressure and the gas is stored at atmospheric pressure. It then gets loaded on a ship. So if we run through the schematic here, it goes offshore, it comes onshore. That onshore facility you can see from the schematic involves a lot of kit. There's a lot of material and, and um, uh, development required and the costs can be significant. Not only that, but you've also got to store it onshore as well. So the liquefied gas needs to be stored in tanks. And those tanks are extremely expensive. Then it gets loaded on the ship eventually. It, it goes to wherever it's going to go. It then unloads onto an, another tank um, and then is regasified as, as and when needed for the market that's involved. And then the ship with a little bit of LNG to keep it cold, goes back to the, the original port, loads up again and comes back. And the key to the economics of this whole process is optimization. This is about running the plant at the optimal level. Otherwise, you tend to lose a lot of money. So the LNG has that global value chain where costs can be absolutely huge. So if we take a typical project, this is a project of around about 10 million tonnes, which is pretty sort of fairly large, but, but you know, world scale at the moment. You're probably talking between one and five billion for the upstream development. Now the upstream development can be quite complex, it can be quite simple. So you might have a very simple field that produces uh, you know, large amounts of gas from single well. It might be that it's unconventional development, you've got thousands of wells. So very, very different and very varied. Then you've got the liquefaction. So a 10 million ton plant will cost you between seven and 12 billion. 
Then you've on the shipping, which might be another one to two billion, could be more if you take, the further you're taking your gas, your LNG, the more the, the, the cost is going to be. So the more ships you need, the more the cost is. And then we've got the regasification, about a billion. So you're talking for a 10 million tonne plant, about 10 to 20 billion. So every LNG project that you hear around, Bontang, room, whatever, they, they are up in that sort of 10 to 20 billion. And some of them, where the, where the development is highly challenged, like the Gorgon project in Australia, that was over 60 billion that Chevron put into that for, for a 15 million tonne or 15.6 million tonne. So the numbers in relative terms to the rest of the industry are absolutely astronomical. And that means that the returns have to be, you know, in order to make a return, you have to really make sure that you optimise your development. You can't afford to have spare capacity. You can't afford to have inefficiencies in the system. It has to run 24-7, 365, pretty much. And those returns, if you look at the, the typical rates of return, in the upstream, it might be 10 to 20%. In the liquefaction, the shipping, the regas, it's all utility returns. So maybe 8 to 10%. And actually, with some of the new projects, it's actually a lot lower than that. Shell's big offshore project, where they did a floating, the first flo big floating FLNG project, <coughs> LNG project, which is on a ship, that has a rate of return of about 2%. They're horrible. I mean, a lots of LNG projects are really horrible investment. They threw off huge amounts of cash, though. So somebody like Chevron or Shell will look to those projects and say the rate of return wasn't great, but the ability to throw off cash for 20, 30, 40, 50 years is huge. And that's what they like them for. But from a rate of return perspective, they look pretty mediocre. So how is gas different to oil? Well, physical properties are different. Gas is much more difficult to handle than oil. You can't just put it in a bottle and, and leave it sitting there. You've got to constrain it. And the energy per unit volume is around a thousand times less for gas. So that energy density is really, really low. So you have to do something to get that density up. Otherwise, it's very hard to make money. Costs, oil is much cheaper to store and transport than gas. On a, on again, on an energy equivalent basis. And LNG is typically more expensive to develop than oil. Not always, but pretty, pretty much. And there are some absolutely whoppers of, of, of uh, exceptions to that. From an operations standpoint, and this is a critical part, global oil supply has unutilized capacity, particularly in countries such as Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. And they can respond with that spare capacity to market dislocations. So you, you might have, I don't know, 100 million barrels of, of, of oil production, but you've got an extra 20 that you don't use unless you need to. So with the oil market, it can respond to changes in the world very, very quickly and very cheaply, because all it does is turn the tap on a bit more. What we don't have in that in gas, and particularly LNG, it's got very limited spare capacity globally. There's very limited opportunity to turn that tap on when you need it, because the tap's already full. So, so it, it's really difficult to try and respond to those market um, anomalies. So you get a market anomaly, and the market either goes short or goes long. There's just the, the, the problem is that ability to turn up and down is very poor. And in the market side, gas primarily competes with coal for markets, not oil. Oil is typically used in transport, and gas is the, is the preferred fossil fuel for power. And oil markets have much greater liquidity than gas markets. If I produce a tanker of oil, I can be pretty sure I can sell it. 24-7, 365 days a year. I can sell that at the going price, whatever the market price is. If I do the same thing with an LNG cargo, today, people would bite my hand off for a cargo. <coughs> Three years ago, I might have been sitting there and lucky to get anything for it.
because the market says I don't want it. And I'll, you know, I'll take it, but at the market price, and the market price might be you know, half of, the, of what it's normally worth. So that liquidity, that lack of liquidity in the, in the, in the gas market, there's a fundamental problem for the global gas market. And environmentally, gas is the least emissions intensive fossil fuel. So I say at least rather than the best, because it's not, still not good, but it's, it's about half of what coal is. So that's why there's been a big move away from coal towards gas. And if we think about LNG trade and the global LNG markets, LNG trade is still a challenging proposition compared to oil. So if we look at crude oil, it gets lots of ticks. You know, you don't need long-term contracts because you have, a, you have a cargo, you can sell it. You've got standardized spot contracts, highly traded markets, pricing you know because there's a global price for, for oil, availability of ships, I can lay my hand on a ship in, in hours, uh, ease of storage, if I, if I don't want to sell it, I can store it somewhere very easily and cheaply. And I can take it just about anywhere. Anywhere that, that uses oil has a receiving terminal. In the 1990s, and back in the old days of LNG, it was all crosses. You couldn't do anything. All you could do was a long-term LNG contract. So that was a 20-year contract. And the it, was, it was called a virtual pipeline. The gas would be liquefied, it would travel to, say, Japan, it would then travel back, and it would essentially, the trade would be for 20 years with ships going back and forth. They would never deviate, no matter what happened. That meant that there was limited liquidity. You, you essentially had these contracts. Now we're looking at a, a bit more liquidity. We've got spot cargoes that are trading a much higher amount than they used to. We've got highly traded markets in the US and Northwest Europe for gas that you can feed into, and Northwest Europe needs all the gas that it can get. We have some degree of standardization of pricing, although there's still quite a lot of variability in terms of how you price it. Availability of ships is greater, but it's variable depending on who you are. If you're Shell, you've got lots of ships. If you're one of the other players, maybe you don't have so much. It's still very difficult to store, and the number of destinations is still limited, but it's growing. So if you have a regas terminal, then you can receive LRG. If you don't, you, you can't get LRG. So you have to have the physical infrastructure there to receive. So unlike oil, the LNG business is still underpinned by long-term contracts. So a long-term contract is typically something about 15 to 20 years long. So if I'm a consumer, I basically sign a contract with a supplier and I basically, that, that gas will flow to me no matter what. I'll have some flexibility on the volumes that come, maybe plus or minus 5%, but I will have to take those volumes for the next 20 years at a particular pricing index. So the, and the reason is because the LNG market has insufficient liquidity to ensure that produced LNG can always find a home at an acceptable price. At that point, <coughs> I was saying, I produce my, my cargo of LNG. If nobody wants it, I'm stuck. And there's a possibility at certain times that I may just have to shove it into a, into a market like the European market and get three or four dollars for it even though the market value at another time might be eight or nine dollars. So, so that, that lack of liquidity is a real issue for, and, and it's a real issue for, for lenders and developers. Buyers of LNG, particularly gas and power utilities, wanted to ensure security of supply through long-term contracts. So typical buyers in, in the Far East, like Japan, Korea, they wanted to make sure that gas arrived. They didn't want somebody outbidding them for a cargo, as would happen with oil. They wanted to be in a situation where that gas would come, otherwise the lights go out. So 20-year contract, absolutely happy to sign that as a utility. And due to the massive capital costs we took, nearly, you know, maybe 60, 70 billion dollars associated with LNG, developers and lenders need to ensure a degree of security of production and price. 
They need to be, have some visibility on that cash flow going forward. If they don't have that, then they can't finance it. The risk is too high. And most LNG projects you've seen have a pretty marginal rate of return for, for the oil and gas sector. Tenor of LNG contracts is variable, could be as low as five in some cases, but most likely towards 20 years, and t depending on developer and buyer needs. And the LNG market is still dominated by long-term contracts, but the amount of spot and short-term trading is increasing, and the flexibility of contracts is increasing. And most of those contracts are, are, are linked to uh, oil, but some are linked to other prices, like US and European gas prices. Where there are liquid markets, they, they take their pricing off those. So they're becoming increasingly common. So how does price set? And this is a fundamental um, point. Unlike oil, there's no uniform regional pricing methodology for gas or LNG. It's not like you can look up you know, the newspaper and see what the Brent oil price is or the WTI price. The fact is different markets have different pricing. So we've got value-based pricing where countries will look at the, the competing fuels and they will price them in accordance with those competing fuels. So that's typically crude oil or oil products. So in places like Singapore, Japan, oil link contracts are common. And the reason was, in Japan, was the alternative to burning LNG was burning oil. So the fact is they would price it just a little bit below oil so that they you know, were actually slightly better off, but they would take the gas. And there was no environmental considerations in those days. But they still do the same thing. Oil link contracts are the most common um, uh, value-based structure. And then you've got the cost-based structure, which is what you see in Europe, is what you see in um, North America. So that's direct competition of gas against gas. And that basically, the price is set by the marginal, you know, <coughs> thousand cubic feet. So if you think about that cost curve of gas, how much volume you've got rising up, depending on your demand, that will set the marginal cost of gas. So that high price, that, that marginal, so if you have a consumption of you know, 50 BCF per day, that will set the marginal supply. So we'll look at all the supplies, the cheapest come first, then it will go to the higher and higher. The price of the whole market is set by that marginal um, molecule, if you like. And that's how markets, gas markets work on a marginal basis, which is exactly how the oil market works with a few other complexities. Or it can be set by affordability. So this is where you start to see governments uh, controlling and subsidizing prices. So they say, what can our, our people afford? And that's when you start to see, you know, crazy in, in places like the Middle East, crazy low prices, a dollar per MMBTU, when the rest of the world's paying 10 or 20. That, those prices are, are effectively subsidized. And they tend to be phased out uh, over time because effectively they just don't make economic sense. So in, in immature markets, gas prices are typically linked to competing fuels. Um, and in more sophisticated commoditized markets, that gas to gas competition is prevalent. And gas hub pricing, so you've heard, you may have heard of things like MBP, the national balancing point, that's the price of gas in the UK. There's an equivalent in the Netherlands called TTF, and we'll see those prices are effectively the hub prices, and they're set by the marginal price of gas. So remember all of that, <laughs> um, because we're now going to look at how, how that Im uh, Im uh, impacts the, the energy crisis. Because what we're seeing today is a lot to do. If, this, if what was happening was, in, was not in gas, but was in oil, the market would have responded. And those price dislocations we've seen in the market, these crazy prices of you know, $90 relative to a normal price of eight, those prices wouldn't have, wouldn't have happened. 
So let's look at Europe in terms of its balance, in terms of primary energy ban. This is in 2020, so before things got messed up. So if you look at the balance in Europe, you've got, forget about oil, because that's largely used in the transport sector, but in the power and, and domestic market, you know, the main, the main uh, fuels are you know, coal, so gas, coal, nuclear, hydro, and renewables. And you can see that, that gas makes up about a quarter of that. So it's not huge. There are markets with a lot more gas being utilized. So places, North America, because it's got so much gas, it uses a lot more gas, particularly in the industrial sector, but also prevalent in the power sector. But then there are other markets like India and China where gas is just a tiny portion. They're heavily weighted towards coal. And they're trying to move away from coal, but it, it's a slow process. So Europe's sort of in the middle, and it has that mix. But gas, from a power generation perspective, gas is a fundamentally important fuel. And Europe's pricing has moved very quickly away from oil index, where you essentially price and you say, this gas is going to sell at X percent of the oil price. So when the oil price goes up a bit, your gas price goes up. That's what it used to be, long-term contracts with oil, oil linkage. But the EU, in its infinite wisdom, decided that that wasn't good, that they could do better for their, for their customers in Europe by moving to gas-on-gas -gas competition. And that was driven heavily by EU policy and was reflective of the confidence that the EU had on the long-term availability of gas. They thought there would be gas, you know, d um, indigenous gas from the North Sea, from Norway, and, and other sources like Russian gas, like Algerian and North African gas, like um, gas from, from the Southern Corridor, Azerbaijan, etc. And so there was a real shift over that period of 15 or 12, well actually sorry, 12 to, to 15 years, where all those oil index contracts got replaced by gas on gas competition contracts. So they, were, so they moved away from those relatively safe oil, con oil index contracts to quite volatile. And at the time, Gazprom, who was a big producer, actually said, don't do this because the gas prices in Europe could be manipulated by somebody like us. <laughs> and the EU said, no, no, don't worry, we can, we can sort it. And so the, that move was very much driven by that policy and that expectation there would always be gas in the market. So if we look back to 2020 and look at what the market had, ha what had happened in the market and what, what, was, what we thought was going to happen, so this is the, the historic forecast of European supply. So on the top, we've got LNG, then we've got Russian gas, then we've got things like North Africa, the, um, uh, what do you call it, Southern Corridor gas, and then we had indigenous, which is including Norway. So we knew that Norway was sort of heading down, that, that the U UK and et cetera, the North Sea was heading down, but essentially it was pretty boring. I mean, nothing ever happened in the European gas market. When you looked out, things would change by a few percentage points. LNG always flowed. Sometimes it didn't flow as much. So post Fukushima, you can see the volumes flowing into Europe were actually a lot less because more was going to Japan. But the market balanced out and it was fine. Um, the key thing about that LNG, if you were comparing this to Japan, Japan, all of that would be long-term contracted supply, firm, absolute rock-solid guaranteed. Most of the gas coming into Europe is not like that. It's flexible. It's, it's, it's not on long-term contracts. So if somebody's prepared to offer a better price somewhere else, it'll flow there. So that flexibility uh, is great for producers. It's also great for buyers because essentially if they don't want some volume, they can offload it to somebody else. But that, that is a critical part of this process is the fact that that is fairly volatile. And what we thought for Russia was that Russia would actually increase a little bit and would just keep going. It would balance the market.
So it was, it was making up something like about 35 to 40 percent of the market. And that was life in the European market. It was pretty dull. And we, you know, within Wood Mac, people would say, oh, I don't want to work in Europe. It's so boring. Well, the last 12 months <laughs> have changed that. So 12 months, spectacular change with, with the invasion of y Ukraine. That once in a generation dislocation and disruption of the market has happened. So between 2018, on the left hand side, you can see the proportion of gas that was <coughs> LNG moved from about 12% to 35% in the space of four years. And most of that occurring actually in the last, in the last year, in, in, from 21 to 22. And at the same time, Russian gas going down. We'd never seen anything like that before in the Russian market, uh, in, the, in the European market. And if we look at the TTF price, which is the sort of proxy European gas price, based on gas-to-gas -gas competition, what we can see is it was starting to rise towards the Russian crisis. There was a shortage in the market. Global <coughs> LNG and coal markets were a bit short, so <coughs> the prices were rising anyway. Then you started to see the build-up of, of, of troops on the border of Ukraine. Prices really started to spike. There was a real concern that there was going to be a, a concern about long-term supply. And that, that, that sort of fuzzy blue line, that is the coal-to-gas switching price. So that's the price at which, based on the carbon price, you switch. If you don't have enough gas, you switch to coal. Now, because there's a higher carbon cost associated with coal, that price is quite high. So what you see there, the, the price should never really go above the coal to gas switching price. But that's because markets don't, uh, you know, that's when markets work. When markets stop working and there's not enough supply, then that's when you get these premia. So you started to see premium premia coming out of 10, 20, 30 dollars. That was all panic. That wasn't anything real, it wasn't anything to do with the market. It was just the market panicking about the fact that we couldn't get gas and there was going to be a shortage. And that panic just it was exacerbated as the price went up. The coal to gas switching price also went up because the coal price was also going up as well. Um, but then you ended up with a sort of perfect storm in the summer where you had a power crisis, you had nuclear plants closing down because of lack of water, because the, the, there wasn't enough water, and prices went through the roof. And so you got up to, and it's only showing $70 here on a monthly basis, but it got up as high as $90 in MMBTU. That's from what in 2020 was about sort of five, six dollars, in fact lower at some stages. So the premium, I mean, that, that's a dislock. It's like, it's like the oil price going from $50 a barrel to $500 a barrel. It's an enormous dislocation. So what had happened? Well, essentially, if you, if you look at this map, you've got a bunch of pipelines coming from Russia and going into Europe. Some of them go via the Baltic, so the Nord Stream pipelines. There's two, although one, the second one, it was never commissioned. So actually, it never, it never did flow gas. But the other pipelines run through Poland, and there's other pipelines run through Ukraine. They blew up the Nord Stream pipeline, and both pipelines. That actually had actually stopped producing. So the fact that when it blew up, it didn't actually disrupt production because there wasn't anything flowing through it at the time. The only gas that was, was leaking out there was gas that was in the pipeline just sitting. But those other pipelines essentially started to reduce. And before the invasion, the, the, the overall supply of Russian gas had started to go down. And so if we, if we look at what we thought in March, which was at the, after the invasion, that's the, the red dotted line, we thought, well, you know, they'll still supply gas. This is before they blew up Nord Stream. They'll still supply gas, maybe some of Nord Stream is, is pe pegged back, but they'll stick to the contracts they have and it'll slowly decline. Well, we got that wrong. 
and the market actually didn't see this coming. So effectively, within the space of the, the six months uh, from, from summer to, to into, uh, into winter, essentially it was clear that production of, of Russian gas into Europe would drop dramatically in 2023. And so the only gas we've got, so all the, all the gas coming via Nord Stream, all the stuff coming through Poland, all the stuff coming through Ukraine, all of that was cut off, is effectively now cut off. The only gas that's flowing is stuff coming through Turkey. And that's going to Eastern Europe. So we suddenly ended up with, you know, 25% of our supply, which we thought was cast iron, according to Angela Merkel, was suddenly gone, or 20% 20, 20 or 90% or, you know, of that 25% was gone. So that resulted in that dramatic drop-off in supply. And then if we look at LNG imports, it was always intended that there would be more LNG, but you had to squeeze out more. You had to squeeze about 40 BCM, which is quite a lot of, of LNG. You had to find that in the market. And that was, that was really challenging. Fortunately, in 2022, there were a number of things that went well for us. COVID issues in China meant that the Chinese didn't need as much LNG. They were able to divert. The, the weather in, uh, up, and then the run up to winter was actually pretty, pretty mild. And so as a result, there was actually a lot of LNG. There was, at one point, there was something like 40 vessels sitting in the Mediterranean looking to offload the gas that they couldn't, that the, there wasn't a, enough physical capacity. So actually 2022 winter wasn't that bad because we managed to fill up storage and some of those prices in Europe actually went down quite low um, because there was a general belief that storage was pretty good. But what's going to turn the tide is essentially new LNG. We haven't got any other sources. There's no more to come from, there, there's maybe a bit more to come from North Africa. There's maybe a bit more to come out of Norway. There's maybe a bit more to come through the, uh, the, the southern corridor from Azerbaijan. But actually, most of the requirement is for new LNG. The problem with LNG is you can't turn the tap on because the tap's fully on. So you need new projects if, that's gonna, if, if, if you're going to um, bring new gas to the market. So you need to, to take a final investment decision on a project. So you have to create your project. You have to find the gas. You have to take final investment decision. And then you've got at least three years of development before first gas. So we've got this problem as we need more gas, but there just isn't, the, the tap won't, is, is full on. And the only way you can increase the pipe, diameter of the pipe to get more gas coming through is essentially to build more projects. And that takes time. So in essence, what we can see here is the final investment decisions. We need to, those decisions to be made in 2023 if that gas is going to turn up in 2026. Because if it doesn't and things slow down, then we're going to be short. And so this, this crisis may go on for longer than we think. Now, one of the benefits, you might say, of this whole crisis is the impact it's had on gas demand. So if you look at the supply uh, in 2020, if you look at the top level, it was pretty flat. Demand for gas was pretty flat. And so the supply of LNG increased a bit, Russian gas increased a bit, but essentially it went down, I think it was about 1% per annum, nothing, nothing great. If we look at the dotted line on the right-hand side, that's what we thought in March was going to be demand. And this is what we think now. So we've seen in the space of two or three years, we've, been, we've seen about a 20% reduction in demand in that, in that year 2023. So the fact is, people have run away from gas. Industry has run away from gas. I don't know about you, but you know, I'm using less gas at home, and I'm getting used to that. Industry is doing the same. Power generation is moving faster towards renewables. 
So actually, from a ga if I was in the gas business, this hasn't been good for business. I've made money up front, but I'm actually going to lose market long term. So for the players who are looking at you know, supplying gas into the European market longer term, it's actually not a good story. And it's not, it's not, it's not improved for them. So let's look at pricing, because this is what everybody's interested in, because that's what governs what your you know, monthly bill is. What we saw in 2021 and 22 was a rising, and this is, this is not including the, the panic premium, because this is done using our model, and our model doesn't panic. It just makes, tries, tries to balance the market. So what you saw was in 2022, that peak um, in, in March, we thought the peak might be a little bit lower, but actually it was higher. What we see in 23 is again now higher. It's still a bit lower than 22, but that doesn't include that panic premium. And all you need to do is change some of the fundamentals in the market, and that panic premium could be huge again. So what we have is a period where you know, the market remains tight, and essentially the price remains high. So and, you know, you'll hear the politicians saying, oh, we just need to get through this winter. Absolute nonsense. We need to get through to the next wave of LNG. And if that wave of LNG doesn't come, which is possible, or it might not come as fast, then that process, that curve, stays high for longer. It eventually starts to come down in 2025, 26, when more LNG starts to flow out of the U and it's mostly out of the US. So we've got to see those LNG projects coming out of the US. Then it gets to the point where the market's in balance again. So with, a, with all the developments that are proposed, we reckon that by 26, 27, the market's back in balance. You're back down to about eight or nine dollars, which is the price set by the marginal LNG cargo out of the US. That's the way it should be. That's the market working properly. It then pings back up again slightly because essentially there's a rebound. There's, a, there's, there's big demand in places like Pakistan and Bangladesh where at the moment they've just stopped buying LNG and the lights go out because they can't afford it. When the price goes down, they, buy, they fill their boats and they have lots and lots of, of you know, cargoes. And that's what happened. That demand, um, that demand elasticity is, is really important in the demand. So the price falls low, demand increases. And that will, again, pull the price back up again. But, it, but it's still within levels of you know, 10 to $12. So what are the uncertainties for European prices? And I've kind of done this on the basis of up and down. So based on what? Cold weather. If we have a, like a super cold winter next year that starts in October, then all bets are off. <coughs> you, you will see the price go up. Stronger China recovery. If what we're seeing around post-COVID continues, then they're going to want more of their LNG. And it's their LNG. They've contracted it. Supply and infrastructure disruptions. If something happens, if things like regas terminals don't stop functioning or there's, uh, there's problems, one of the LNG projects in the US uh, had a fire. That caused a really significant input because there was about 8 million tonnes taken out of the system. Warmer weather, lower European and Asian demand. You know, if, if, you, if, if demand for, uh, particularly in the industrial sector, goes down, if domestic demand goes down, then, then you could see that, that ameliorating and that, that lowering the price. And a recession, if we go into recession, that will also impact. Economic growth is an important part. And then we get out to LNG commissioning delays. So as I said, if that LNG doesn't turn up, we're in trouble. Stronger European-Asian demand responds to lower prices. So Pakistan, Bangladesh, Southeast Asia, if they go really mad for new L and cheap LNG, that will drive the price back up again. <coughs> you know, what could soften it? More LNG FIDs in the next couple of years. Everybody goes crazy and, and develops new LNG on the prospect of the... And that might happen. It's, it's 
maybe less likely than there being a restriction, but it's certainly possible. Limited Asian demand response to lower prices or some Russian pipe gas coming back into Europe. And you might say that'll never happen, but you know, what's the route out of this? The, the, the political analysts are saying, what's the route out of this Ukraine situation? Maybe that is partly the EU saying, yes, we'll take some gas, not nothing like what we took before, but we'll take some. And we'll take that through a variety of different routes. And that's part of the sort of reconciliation around the Russian-Ukraine situation. Increased LNG dependency makes global markets more volatile. That's, you know, post-2030, post really a possibility, even more volatile than we've seen. Emerging Asian markets actually start to look at, at alternatives um, instead, of, turning, uh, in, in, instead of, of, of using gas. So that might soften again. If the demand softens, that might soften price. So there's lots of things that can fundamentally go on here that will change the picture that I showed you early on price. But, but fundamentally, the next two years, it's either bad or very bad. There's no good, sadly, because the LNG is just not turning up because it's physically not there. So what are the key takeaways? The cutting off of Russian pipe gas resulted in a massive dislocation once in a generation in one of the world's largest gas markets. And that has seen prices go to levels we've never seen before. Short-term management of the gas shortfall has been achieved through pooling LNG from Asia, so we've taken gas from the likes of China, as well as switching power generation from gas to coal. So from an environmental standpoint, it's not been great and, and won't be for the next few years because places like Germany are going to be using more coal than they've, they've been using before. Um, there's also a demand reduction, particularly in industry. Industry is saying, I can't operate with this cost of gas, so like things like fertilizer, they just shut down. And they, and they may well move to the Gulf Coast where they can guarantee relatively low cost gas for the next 20 years. The gas market in Europe is unlikely to rebalance before 2026. Thus, expect wholesale gas prices to remain high for the next few years. New LNG supplies will be needed to rebalance the market. There's no other way that that's going to happen. And so there's a lot riding on that. So, you know, watch out for the headlines of new LNG projects being taking final investment decision in, in North America. The long-term implications of the crisis are a potential speeding up of the energy transition in Europe, reducing gas demand longer term. I think there's no doubt that that is going to happen. People have been scared by what's happened. You know, independent, energy independence is becoming much more prevalent. But there are lots of uncertainties that could move the market in different ways. So watch out for those spikes because they'll happen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a real conundrum because you've got buyers on one side who are saying, oh, energy transition, do I want to sign a long-term 20-year contract for gas that I might regret somewhere down the line? The supplier or the developer of the LIG project is saying, well, I can't develop it unless you do. So how, how does it work? And the, the, the main thing, what's, what we're seeing happening is that... Um, Companies like Shell, portfolio play, LNG portfolio players are serving that middle role. They're signing 20-year agreements for the, to, to, finance the, to allow the projects to be financed, and then they're supplying the gas to whoever needs it. So they're taking on the risk, but because of their massive portfolios, they're saying, look, in five years' time or 10 years' time, if RWE doesn't want to buy it, I'll find somebody else to buy it. I've got such a network of ships, et cetera, I will, I will cash in. So what's been interesting is, if you look at the utilities, which who you would have expected were buying all this LIG from North America, very few of them are actually doing it. 
what they're doing is they're relying on Shell to do it for them. Because what they'll then do is to say, well, we'll buy from you Shell for five years. And, and of course, Shell will say, yeah, sure, but you're going to pay a premium. And so we'll get more value out of it and we'll take the risk. And so that means everybody's happy. RWE is happy because they've just bought enough gas and they're not committing themselves long term to gas. And essentially, the, 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 the supply, the developer is happy because he gets to develop his project with a 20 year agreement. And Shell's happy because they've got lots of flexibility and flexible volumes that they can sell all around the world. The carbon footprint of LNG is higher than, say, pipelined out of Norway. But what's happening is there's been a real uh, uh, um, increase in attention to the emissions associated with LNG to reduce those, to get those down. And if you look at new projects, okay, the old, the old horrible projects out of the Middle East, they'll always be horrible. They have very high carbon footprints. But the new ones are all really tight in terms of, of, of emissions. They're probably not terribly far away from pipeline gas. And the other thing is that Russian pipeline gas, there was no um, transparency around the emissions. There was lots of talk about you know, leaks all through the system, large amounts of methane loss, but nobody knows other than Gazprom, I suspect, and they're not saying. So, so whether it's, so, uh, you know, I had a discussion with, with a, with a um, reporter the other day and they're saying, oh, you know, LNG is terrible. Well, is it better than Russian gas? And the answer is we don't know. But one of the things is the LNG industry is surely getting its act together to try and reduce those emissions. And so those really carbon intensive projects are really not coming through it. The, the, the carbon intensity of new projects tends to be much lower. But it's still an issue. And when we have a carbon border adjustment mechanism, like we might in Europe at some stage, not, not in the near future, but that's where those low intensity projects will capitalize. I think that in terms of things like you know, phasing out of gas boilers, that is not going to be somebody, it might be individuals saying, oh right, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my gas boiler and I'm going to scrap it and I'm going to get an air source heat pump. What I think you're going to see is of incremental development of housing. So new houses have to have you know, um, um, heat source pumps, so electric-derived electric heating. Um, but that, that is a relatively slow process. If everybody was to say, oh, you know, you can't have, because what if you live in a flat and you can't have a, an air source heat pump? You, you, you're you're going to go, cool, that, that's not going to happen. So the process is a, is, is a relatively slow one. Power generation, you know, there's lots of, of gas-fired power capacity in Europe and there will continue to be. You don't need new gas-fired power capacity, you just use it less as renewables take, take precedence. So you have more, more wind coming in and the, and the gas cuts back. The great thing about gas is it's very flexible. So when the wind doesn't blow, the gas picks up. When the wind blows, the gas goes down. And that's essentially how the market is balanced. And so that demand is really going to be dictated by the pace of of renewable development. Not so much residential, because that's going to be slow, but it's actually going to be the pace. But you're already seeing it. You know, what you're seeing is mo potentially more focus in, in certain parts of Europe around nuclear and, and certainly renewables going faster than they originally anticipated. Well, not, not really, because ultimately what they've got, the pipelines are in place. I mean, there's a bit of a repair job on Nord Stream uh, <laughs> by about 100 metres. But, you know, the, the fact is there's, eno there's, there's enough capacity. So the capacity is already sunk. So all you need to do is turn the valves on on those West Siberian fields and it will flow.
And that's some of the cheapest gas anywhere. So you compare that with the cash cost of LNG out of the US, that cash cost is actually quite high because you're paying a liquefaction fee, you're paying the Henry Hub price, so the, the price of gas in the market, so maybe that's $4. You pay $2.50 for liquefaction, you pay another dollar. So that's you landing at cost, cash cost, on an ongoing basis, $7 per MMBTU. The Russians could probably supply gas in at four. But there's 20-year contracts. Well, th there's 20-year contracts for capacity. So that, that supply, you know, that capacity is taken by somebody and somebody will take that. If the price drops below that cash cost, then the, 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 the guy who owns the capacity might say, you know what, I'll not take it. Because it can do that that 20 year contract's an agreement, but the, the, the shell might say, actually I can't sell this gas at a profit, so I'll just not, I'll just not take it. And that's what we see in some of our more complex modeling, we've done sort of work with, with some of the majors around this, is US capacity in the summer months actually switching off because there's too much gas in the market. So they just say, well, the price is too low, it's maybe $6, and my cash cost is $7. It's not worth me producing it. It's not, but I think the fact is most of this is about um, the, the, the people who are making money out of this scenario are the majors who are not actually owning the, the LNG projects. That's being done by developers. What they're doing is buying capacity. And they're just saying, you give me, you, know, you, you, you liquefy this amount of gas for me and I will pay you a fee every year for that liquefaction service. And then we'll take that gas. I can choose, if the price goes down too low, I can choose not to take it. But actually, once I get it into my portfolio, I'm maybe paying $6 at the, at the point that it's loaded onto the vessel. I've then got the opportunity to take that anywhere in the world sure. because I've got a port. And this is a whole other presentation. But this is what makes Shell, Total, Exxon, to a certain extent Chevron, but, but the big players, BP, that's what makes them so powerful in the LNG market is that it's almost they've built a castle that's unassailable. You can't, you can't fight because they've become so big that to play against them, they just undercut you. And the only people that are really doing it are the traders. So the Trafiguras, the Gunvors, the, the, you know, the main tr commodity traders. They're the, one, the only ones that are, are playing that game as well because they have the balance sheet to go and sign you know, deals with, with these capacity, or, or for capacity. Yeah, well th this is what they, the sort of taught the rhetoric is, you know, we're going to send more gas to China. <laughs> the problem is, the gas that served um, Western Europe came from West Siberia, and the gas that would serve China comes from East Siberia. And it's a long, long way. Um, so actually, yes, they can supply more gas out of, of East <coughs> Siberia uh, into China, but, but it doesn't affect what's happened with that, that, that West Siberian gas, which is kind of in the ground. Remember, you know, Russia has a huge demand itself. I mean, it's a very large country with a large consumption of gas. So it's not as if everything stopped. It's just the fact the export piece has stopped. That they still produce a very large amount of gas. Um, no, ga no, actually we don't. And that's part of the problem, is that we don't have enough storage capacity. The more storage we had, the more we could fill in summer when demand for gas is low. And that's what happens. I mean, the French have storage. There, there is storage in Europe, but not enough. And there's, n there's almost none in the UK. So essentially, because the, the EU believed that actually this wouldn't happen, that the, the, there would always be supply and the market would always work properly. But the market doesn't always work properly.
and actually sometimes it, it works really badly, which is what it's doing just now. Is infrastructure actually happening? I mean, yeah. What well, I mean, to be honest, the, the German government, the, the, the problem, the major problem was Germany, because Germany had no regas infrastructure. So, you know, an LNG cargo could turn up, but there was nothing to turn it into gas. So they have thrown money at it, and they've got a very rapid expansion planned for, for regas capacity. So there's a huge infrastructure development, and it's the government that's throwing money. They're not looking to the, the, the private sector. They're, they're, they're encouraging the private sector, but they're throwing a lot of money at it themselves. So that, that might be slower than we anticipated, and that creates problems. So if you have you know, a slower development of regas capacity, particularly in Northwest Europe, that could have an impact because you might have, you know, a lot of gas trying to get in, but it can't get in because there's a vessel, you know, unloading at the time. And that's what we had in the summer was in the Med, we had a lot of volume sitting on the water waiting to get in, but, you know, the capacity was, was full. And so it was waiting weeks and weeks to get in. The position around um, India is that there's actually not much change in terms of India's demand. Countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh are very sensitive, but actually India's got a lot of long-term contracted supply. It's not that exposed. And the way the market works, it actually is quite favourable for, for supply to continue to flow. But LNG into India is very small. I mean, it's, it's nothing like China. China's, you know, again, outstripped it. But if you, if you go back to that first slide that I had, you know, coal is still king by miles. Probably not for the near term, because that sort of obsession, you know, security of supply has become the most important thing. I was at presenting at the, the General Assembly of the buyers group called GII GNL of LNG. And if I'd been there a year previously, I was talking about emissions of LNG. And if I'd been there a year previously, I suspect I would have had about 150 questions. I think I had two questions. Because everybody's gone, forget that. Our, pro our problem is security of supply. So that has become the primary interest so essentially everything else fill, falls back into you know, insignificance in the whole thing. Yeah, Simon Frame. Um, you talk there a bit, you know, really looking forward to that, that new supply you know, arriving from the US. Yeah. Maybe you could say, I mean, are there any things that we should worry about in terms of that supply turning up? And I guess where I'm coming from is there's been you know, some coverage in the last week or two around resource nationalism in the US, also some of these shale plays are getting quite matured, so again in terms of those issues and others, are there any concerns about that supply? I, I mean I think there is, there's no doubt that um, you know, exposure to, to large amounts, you know, buyers have in the past talked about unwillingness to get overexposed to any one market. And it's quite interesting, in Japan, they look at US as quite a risky place uh, for supply because you know, the, the US ca has had a track record of, of interfering in, because of politics. So the fact is, yes, but I think at the moment, the, again, it's all bets are off because they're the only guys who are actually pushing forward fast enough that can, can deliver the solution. So if you look at somewhere like Mozambique, hundreds of TCF of gas, but yet they can't get anything built because of the security situation. You know, Qatar is doing its best to do, so it's got one mega project that it's just taken FID on, there's a second one coming, you know, that will, that will increase supply by about 32 million tonnes, which is pretty big. But even that's not enough. You need the US and you need all these different developers with a degree of certainty around that gas supply. And that gas, you know, the prospect of that gas going, you know, 
the, because what, what we're talking about, if, if you're saying, well, some of the shale plays aren't performing as well, is that that cost of supply will go up. And, and that might happen. And, and buyers will have to go, huh. And it'll probably end up with a complete transfer of a higher price elsewhere, you know, where, wherever the markets are. Because they'll, be so, they'll be such an important part of the market. Yeah, I think I mean to be honest, that's the that's the for me is one of the big uncertainties is how how much damage is this going to have done? You know, if you're a Japanese consumer, you're probably saying it's not that big a deal. I I know you know I understand I'm having to buy a few cargos that are costing me considerably more, but in terms of my weighted average cost of gas, including all my other supplies of gas that are all contracted on on oil indexation. The, the effect is limited. But there are other markets, you know, you would think some of these very price sensitive markets like Pakistan, Bangladesh, you know, to a certain extent, some of the Southeast Asian countries, they are going to be looking at this and saying, this is a horrible market to be exposed to. You know, do we want long term to commit to this? One of the fundamental problems in these markets is they have already committed heavily to gas. So you take Pakistan, almost all of their gas of their of their power generation capacity is gas. And so in order to shift away, they need more and more investment in power. And so some of that gas is you know will not be used. Well, you know, how does that work economically? So there's a lot of questions, but as I said, one of the long-term questions is do people look at gas differently after what's happened? And after three years, I think people are going to go, you know what, it's just a bit too risky. And that volatility that we've seen, you know, that horrible three-year period, that will stick in people's minds. But it depends for how long. You know, m m memories are short when the price goes down. And it's amazing that, and I've seen it, you know, 30 years of doing this, I've seen people go, oh, you know, never again. And then as soon as the price goes down, they're out, you know, buying and, and you know, it's just memories are short. Is it in three or four years' time, if that's how it's going? We're three or four years closer to 2050 and the energy transition. So yeah. Yeah, you know, I think the fact is the energy transition in, 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 in practical terms has been put on hold. So, you know, for the next three or four years, until there's a, a balance in the market, it's hard to see how that... I think longer term, it actually incentivizes a, a faster move. But it, what's happening now is, is, you know, completely counter. But it's, it's like, you know, the conversation I had at, in Paris. People are saying, I've got bigger fish to fry. And that bigger fish is keeping the lights on in Europe and other markets. Yeah, although even, even if you look at the Woodmax energy transition views, so the one and a half degree scenario, the two degree scenario, nuclear doesn't grow a lot. But fundamental to those scenarios, and this again, this is another talk I could do, um, is essentially that, that you, know, you need to find solutions to some of the, to, to what I think are two of the biggest issues in the energy transition, and that is hydrogen. And, and CCS, so carbon capture and storage. Without those two, the whole thing just doesn't make any sense. It, it really is a struggle.